Okay. Hi. Good to see everybody. So I'm Neil Cohen, and this is our second in the public mental health program series. And our guest tonight is Dr. Adam Perpati. And Adam is the Executive Deputy Commissioner at the DOHMH, and he oversees the uh, Mental Hygiene Division. And for those of you who may not be aware, the health department and the Department of Mental Health, Mental Retradition, Alcoholism Services merged in January or February 2002 into one agency, which is now the DOHMH, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And the vision behind that was that uh, the city would be better served by a more integrated uh, public health model. And uh, historically, mental health and mental hygiene related services, including substance, uh, substance abuse, of course, uh, and developmental disabilities had been very marginalized and quite separate. And the uh, agencies had very different uh, modes of operating. When I was, uh, when I was commissioner, uh, I, as a psychiatrist, I was uh, appointed commissioner of Department of Mental Health initially, and I became very jealous of the Department of Health's uh, ability to recruit uh, recently trained uh, public health folks with MPHs who were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to go. And in my agency, the Department of Mental Health, uh, we had a lot of social workers who were great, but who were often coming to us because they were clinically a bit somewhat burnt out by the rigors of working uh, in New York City, and, um, and generally were not trained in a population-based model. So we thought that the integrated model would provide be a win-win uh, for both agencies. And I think over the course of, of the last decade, there have been some important steps that have been taken, and since Adam took over the reins of the Mental Hygiene Division um, as a medical epidemiologist who trained at the CDC and at uh, Harvard School of Public Health, and although not trained as a psychiatrist, he's easily, a, he's been an early adapter, <laughs> and has, uh, I, I think, made a lot of progress in bringing the Mental Hygiene Division toward a population-based perspective. And he's going to talk to us today on uh, public health approaches to improving population mental health in New York City experience. And in the course of this, he's going to give us some insights into the uh, research agenda that uh, the Mental Hygiene Division is uh, looking to accomplish. And we can think about how we, as a relatively new kid on the block, might be able to contribute to that uh, vision and that, to, to that agenda. And for Patrick. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, it's uh, great to be here. It's not the first time, um, and uh, it feels very comfortable. Of course, I have a lot of friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, and so, uh, hopefully we can make this kind of informal and, uh, and uh, we can have a conversation. Um, uh, thanks to Neil for inviting me. Of course, the credit for um, bringing the two agencies together rests um, uh, largely with him. Um, a vision of an integrated agency where health um, and um, mental health um, are more closely linked and public health approaches are brought to bear on, um, on challenges of, of public mental health. Uh, it's really a sort of a result of a lot of Neil's vision and, and a lot of what I'll be saying uh, today, um, trying to think about it in the context of the, of the book that Neil edited with Sandra Glay at Columbia. And, um, and so some of this is, I think, um, trying to articulate some new approaches and new directions for the health department um, as we think about this challenge. Um, I'll speak a little bit about some of the work we're doing presently and, um, and, and along the way. Um, so it'll be a bit of a mix of sort of future thinking and, and current work. And along the way, as, as Neil said, to try to think about what the research gaps are, where academic government partnerships um, might be fruitful. Um, and uh, things like that. So please feel free to interrupt me as well. And just other, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't ask you ahead of time, the time, time check. Just about, I'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes. Okay. So, it, you know, so I'm a government public health guy. So I'll speak about things somewhat in the context of, of our work here. Um, these are, you know, this is the uh, national um, standards for what um, health departments should be doing. And sort of 
I found it a useful framework to try to think about how to integrate um, challenges of behavioral health into our work. Because um, not all of these really necessarily fit so closely with the work of the public, public mental health system. Um, but I'll try to get, go through and give some examples of them, um, of what sorts of things we're doing uh, in the context of these so-called essential public health services. Um, and, and this larger challenge of how to think about prevention when it comes to mental illness. Um, uh, when it comes to substance use, I think it fits the public health framework a little more easily, but mental health, I think there's some challenges in thinking about uh, prevention, but some very exciting um, um, evolution and, and research that, that, that offers us some, some strategies. Um, how to think about health, uh, mental health in a, at a population level, and increasingly how to think about some of these environmental or contextual influences on health that are well described in, in, in for other conditions um, and beginning to be um, described increasingly for, for mental illness as well. Um, so that this notion of prevention and serious mental illness, um, I'll talk later about sort of, you know, the idea of, you know, what the prevention agenda is for schizophrenia, for example. Um, but uh, I just wanted to sort of illustrate a bit of the tension between the traditional work of a public mental health agency and sort of thinking about um, thinking about it from a public health perspective and a prevention perspective. This is the SAMHSA definition of recovery and sort of promoting recovery and, and um, a more effective and um, stronger system of mental health services for people with serious mental illness is a priority and is a sort of orienting feature of our, of our work. But, you know, the recovery perspective is very much one, it's not really a prevention perspective. Um, it's explicitly not a preventive perspective, actually. And so, when most of our, sort of, historically, most of our efforts have been um, invested in, in this work, which is critical, how do we think about combining a prevention perspective? So, I don't need to talk too much about Jeffrey Rose to this audience, but just to say that, you know, when, <coughs> when Jeffrey Rose was sort of trying to articulate a, 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 a principles of prevention at the population level, he made this important observation that the, the mean rate of certain risk factors or, or exposures in a population predicts the rate of extreme outliers, which was a very interesting and not necessarily intuitive finding. You know, an interesting version of this is, you know, alcohol consumption. This is, this is data from a mul mul uh, the multiple countries. It's national data compiled across countries and they're tracking the mean level, for example, here, mean level of consumption with the prevalence of the extreme, of heavy drinking, of alcoholism. So very interesting at the national level that the average level predicts the mean, that predicts the, the extreme. Which, which, you know, the conclusion being that if you want to do something about outliers, you need to think about the extremes of the population in the context of the entire population. And that strategies that might influence the mean might also influence the extremes, and so the like, I, you know, the question is: Is there are there analogs in for mental illness, for example, um, for depression, um, for for um, for child mental health, where um, how we are doing at the population level um, will tell us something about um, the rates of illness you know, across the population, and and conversely, can we think about prevention? By targeting um, targeting the mean the mean or the median rates of uh, of these exposures, so I don't you know I'm not saying that there's great evidence that that's true, but I think a challenge when you think about prevention for mental illness is whether these types of phenomena actually exist. So these are these are the sort of classic Jeffrey Rose um, arguments that <clears throat> when exposure is distributed across the population in a say a normal distribution like this and risk is, increases in this manner, then you can actually achieve great reductions even in the extremes of illness uh, in a population by shifting the entire curve to the left. So what, what might that look like when it comes to men the mental health of a population? What can we be doing um, at, the, at a larger societal level to think about um, the overall mental health of a population that might actually um, have benefits in reducing the rates of sort of diagnosable mental illness. Okay, so the first 
The first um, topic there in the essential public health function is the surveillance. And so this is, this is surveillance. Um, it's a core function of the health department. Um, and I would say that traditionally for mental illness, um, uh, um, we don't have great surveillance um, structures. We don't have great surveillance systems. Um, we've been trying to do better over the last uh, um, several years about gathering more information on the um, prevalence and distribution of mental illness in the population. And I wouldn't say we're sort of there yet. I would say this is sort of one of those sort of gaps in our, in our, in our knowledge um, and in our, in our processes. So, and, and part of the reason, I think, why that exists is that mental illness, in contrast to some other conditions and exposures that we care about in, in public health, um, is, uh, so, you know, you can think about it sort of what we do surveillance for. We do surveillance for risk factors for illness. Uh, behaviors, for example, like the community health survey um, that we do with the health department, 10,000 people that we call up every year um, and ask how they're doing. Um, we can ask a lot about behavior, smoking and drinking and, um, and sex and uh, all kinds of other things. But, you know, mental illness, of course, not behavior. It's harder to ask about it in that way. We ask about diagnosed conditions. Have you ever been diagnosed with this? Have you ever been diagnosed with that? Which can be useful for mental illness, but most people with um, with mental illness are actually not diagnosed. Um, and so we're left with, traditionally on, on the national studies, left with um, techniques uh, like administering scales, administering scales to individuals for depression or anxiety or, or whatever, which are logistically and sort of um, in terms of the space and the availability of, of, of time and survey hard to do. Um, so there's a number of challenges in collecting information about mental illness population. The other challenge is um, when doing surveillance for mental illness, you want to think about severity and, and, um, and, and how it's distributed in the population. Uh, it, again, offers a level of complexity that we may not have for other for other tests. <coughs> of course, there's no lab tests either. That's another, you know, when you think about HIV surveillance, for example, we do surveillance uh, in many ways on laboratory results. No such analog. So what, what do we have? So this does run through some of the examples. So this is the National Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System, and it's asking about depression. And it asks about depression by using the PHQ scale, right, the nine item uh, uh, scale, and, and, we can, and we can generate distributions across the country. And we do the same thing in New York um, and in the city as well. Um, the large national surveys over the years, these are some of the ones you're familiar with, or National Comorbidity Study, the most recent ones. This is the study that you know produces that one in five or one in four people are diagnosed with mental, you know, mental illness in the past year. Um, but you know, this is an in-person interview using scales, a long in-person interview using scales. So logistically difficult to do. Um, but in those surveys, we get, um, you know not only the prevalence of different conditions, like this, but something about utilization of mental health services. So this is sort of this uh, often cited number that only 40% um, of, uh, of people with, um, with the DSM diagnosis are at care. So in 2004, so, so with that backdrop of the, diff the difficulties in doing mental illness surveillance, um, the department, um, embarked on an ambitious, uh, this was actually under Lauren's leadership, 2004, um, an ambitious effort to do an in-person interview survey for mental, uh, for a variety of conditions, including mental illness, um, and used uh, some scales um, for depression and anxiety, and this was, it allowed us for the first time at the local level to describe um, the prevalence of different conditions and look at different um, populations. Um, so this is just, I pulled out the anxiety data, um, and we were able to look at treatment. Um, and of course, the treatment rates for <coughs> were extremely low. This isn't surprising. This is consistent with, with what we know nationally. Um, so, so we do this kind of surveillance currently using, you know, we have limited amounts of data that we collect in our community health survey, our telephone survey of New Yorkers every year. Um, and then we have, back in 2004, we had an in-person survey. And that's, you know, 
we don't have many other population level um, data sources. Here's some of the things we're doing now to improve that and get a better picture of the population of, of uh, at large here in the city and their, and their profile around mental, mental health. We've expanded, and this is sort of in progress, and hopefully over the next several months, you'll start to see some more data coming out of the health department on this. Um, a mental health module to, to the survey, so actually dedicating some space in our large survey to a specific set of questions around mental illness. Actually following up people in that telephone survey who score high on the um, Kessler's six item scale um, of uh, psychological distress um, to then go back and interview them in greater detail about, about their condition. Looking at new, new opportunities for, for using new data sets for surveillance, in particular Medicaid. So, you know, Medicaid is a, is a, is a um, Medicaid claims have been used for health, you know, health services research. Um, we are interested in sort of taking a look at that from a population perspective. Can we use the Medicaid file to do surveillance and other data sets? Um, in addition, and this again is sort of remarking on sort of what the data gaps are in the city. We don't have great information on what, not only the basic surveillance measures, the prevalence uh, across different populations and things like that, um, but needs assessment. Um, uh, need for services, need for medical services, for social services, um, at the population level, we just, we just don't have. Um, so our, hopefully in the next literally several weeks, we'll be embarking on a large survey of hospitalized patients, trying to get a picture of the most um, serious end of the, of the mental illness spectrum um, and ask about a variety of, of, of uh, medical and social needs. So that'll, that's also fairly unprecedented. And then, importantly, um, working with you folks here, Lorna and her um, to continue and do a follow-up to that 2004 um, city health and nutrition examination survey do it again. Um, and not only are we going to do it again, but we're going to try to use this opportunity to um, get some validity and some comparison between these various scales um, that are used. It's different groups use different metrics, and that also was part of the confusing picture of mental illness surveillance. Um, and we think that some of the aspects of what we're going to do in the survey here will, will actually add significantly to our knowledge about which scales work better with the others, with what does one measure and the other one um, measure, um, in addition to giving us general um, surveillance and balance data. Do you want to say anything more about it? No, it's a challenge. <laughs> the mental health component is a real challenge. We've gone back and forth almost more than any other section, but it's one of the most important ones. So we're very supportive and excited about it, but it's difficult to do. It's difficult. It takes up a lot of space. And, what age group are you? Adults 20 and older. 20 and so I would say that in general, uh, in terms of you know, gaps, like I said before, um, our ability to describe the population in the city with mental illness um, and, um, and, and understand sort of both the interaction with the medical system and the social service system um, and needs are, are is relatively poor. And, and that's, um, I, you know, I, I feel like the public mental health system and the system of care for people with HIV have a lot of uh, analogs. I think we have a lot more information on the population of our city with HIV. Um, another group with a lot of social service needs, a lot of interactions um, with public systems. Um, and, uh, and I think there's some examples from that, from that sector, um, just in terms of uh, surveillance anyway, um, that, we can be, that we can be drawing from. Okay, um, a few other sort of things to say about epidemiologic strategies. Um, We've been interested in trying to articulate in the city uh, uh, where mental illness sits and how important it is in terms of prioritization for, for programs and funding. Um, this is a challenge because the easiest thing for us to do in public health is to measure, um, not the easiest, the most basic thing we do in public health is to measure births and deaths. Um, again, this is something I learned. Uh, uh, led in our department for many years, um, and mortality is the is, is obvious is, is one of the key ways that in public health we prioritize what to invest our efforts and our money in. 
but men alone, of course, doesn't fit the mortality paradigm. Um, and so, you know, we're interested in always in looking for ways of prioritizing different disease states using um, measures not only of mortality, but of morbidity. Um, and I'm familiar with these different ways of doing it, the, the, the quality, the quality the different techniques for doing it, but um, the Dali technique is basically a way of combining um, mortality metrics, years of life lost, with some measure of disability, which is a complex uh, um, formula that has to do with the, the uh, number of cases, the prevalence of the condition, um, the level of severity, and then this, this sort of a bit fuzzy notion of a disability weight, the relative, um, the relative weight of a, of a year spent with that condition compared to a year of perfect health. Um, and when you do this, and you combine disability um, years with years of life lost, this was done in the global burden of disease studies from many years ago. Um, this is one of, this, this exercise is one of the things that, sort of when you look at mortality, this is global, this is you know, international data, you see the traditional like, heart disease, etc. This is where, you know, depression sort of sprang into the top three and was quite effective at sort of highlighting the role of mental illness and its importance in, in the large public health framework. So this is internationally. We tried to replicate this data and see it's, you know, it's old. We don't have the ability to fully measure, for example, the prevalence of these different conditions in the city, as I said before. But using, essentially extrapolating from national data, we were able to show, for example, that depression you know, the blue lines are, here is the contribution from mortality and the red is the contribution from disability. So you see here, car you know, cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of valleys in our city, but depression is number two, alcohol is number four. Um, and they're red, right, because they're not, these are not killers per se, the way these other conditions are. But you do, se you separate things like alcohol use and depression and um, probably substance use and suicide. I don't know where they feel right. like, but like, so. Yeah, I mean, you could add them right. and regular, for example, this, this we took apart different cancers and sometimes we want those together. Because um, they're, they're probably using mortality components to it, right? Right, if you put in suicide, for example, <coughs> that, which, is, which is in here somewhere lower down on the list. Yes, you could imagine. Yeah. So this is prioritization. You know, we've also, you know, for example, in, uh, in our work around, this is moving a little to substance use, but in, for alcohol, trying to estimate the um, contribution of, of, of alcohol consumption to overall mortality um, using these population attributable risk um, uh, calculations that combine the prevalence of the behavior with the risk of that behavior on mortality. And when you do that, you, you know, you sort of get to numbers like this. And again, it's a way of articulating the burden of disease and the burden of poor health um, attributable to different exposures, in this case alcohol, and we actually break it down by these different conditions. And this is something that's done nationally as well here in the city. So I, I show this really just to sort of illustrate the point about um, the need to demonstrate the importance and the um, prominence of these issues in a larger public health framework and sort of from a prioritization. Can okay. you just go back to the yeah. previous one? Can you explain the difference between the contribution of alcohol liver disease and liver disease to right, so alcohol related deaths? Yeah, just so, I mean, these are 100%, you could say these are sort of 100% alcohol attributed because it's sort of defined that way. Okay. So you would say that in New York City, there's, or this is the state actually, there's 600 alcohol liver disease deaths. <laughs> And they're all attributable to alcohol. So you is there a cue? Well, because they're sort of specifically diagnosed that way. Whereas something like homicide, um, there's about uh, 500 homicides a year in New York City. Not all of them are alcohol related. So, you, so the idea is to calculate a portion of the total that's attributable to, in this case, alcohol. And you do that by, uh, by combining information about the prevalence of drinking heavy drinking, and the relative risk of that exposure on the outcome, in this case, homicide. You do that calculation, you calculate an attributable fraction, and apply the total number, and you get some portion that you can then attribute to alcohol. We do that with smoking, for example, also. Right, I was asking about the alcohol liver disease. These are direct. Other liver disease. Right, so some portion of, of liver disease that people, that are coded on death certificates is also attributable to alcohol. 
Right, not that all wasn't of them, identified. But wasn't identified. Yeah, that's what it is. So here, so a little bit now into um, using other other um, data sources for for um, for understanding um, um, mental illness in our city. This is um, a project that came out of um, uh, a um, a panel report um, uh, set of recommendations um, from a city-state um, collaboration to think about the intersection of mental health and criminal justice that was convened in the wake of a number of, of, uh, of um, media incidents, um, you know, not unlike our recent experience, actually. Um, and, um, and we took this opportunity to look at uh, engagement and continuity of care in the public mental health system. So this is now using Medicaid data. So this is an example of sort of new data sources. Um, and we uh, identified a number of cohorts of individuals um, engaged in various parts of the public mental health system, um, many thousands of people, um, and looked at the Medicaid data to see what we could determine in terms of their engagement and, um, and outcomes. And this is, these are the kinds of things we were looking at. Um, of this of this group of 20,000 or so people, um, numbers who had no prescriptions filled in the past 60 days, who had no evidence of outpatient treatment, uh, who had multiple emergency department and hospitalization. So evidence of disengagement, evidence of poor outcomes. And not surprisingly, this was just, uh, this is not, this is not the whole city, this was just in Brooklyn actually, and we see, you know, many hundreds of every month demonstrating these, these attributes of, of disengagement from, from service. Um, so again, this is just purely on the data. Um, this is, and then we sort of took the next step and actually tried to follow up and investigate um, what was going on with these folks. Um, and this, these bars, these are the different cohorts, but it's easy to just still look at the overall numbers. Um, you know, we found that in some cases the data was telling us something and everything, you know, in general was fine. But for you know about half of these folks, um, there was a level of disengagement and a level of clinical concern about the, you know the, uh, being lost to follow up, lost to care, um, requiring uh, potentially requiring intervention. And so it really just showed us things like this. You know, of that 50% group who had uh, that we were concerned about, most had no no identified service provider. You know, they had been touching the public mental health system, <coughs> admitted to a hospital, gone to clinics, but had fallen out of care, and there was no sort of accountable provider or accountable point um, to um, for follow up and for ongoing for ongoing treatment. So it just, I mean, these are not. This is not surprising. These are some of the reasons why um, people fell out of care. Um, I don't think it's surprising anyone in the public mental health system that this is a challenge. But it was sort of part of one of the first times we were able to sort of use um, these, this public data set, Medicaid, to, um, to actually describe and understand this, this phenomenon and point us towards where the follow-ups would need to be. So I think this is, again, it's the kind of area where, um, where doing more rigorous research and understanding about patterns of disengagement from care, reasons for disengagement, strategies for how to re-engage folks, what works and what doesn't. This is, um, I mean, this is what Dan and others have spent a lot of time thinking about, but that, this is a, an important, important view as well. And, you know, then generating feedback to the providers. You know, part of what our goal is to think about accountability and how to, how from government perspective, we can feed information back to the provider community to build accountability and, uh, and quality. And so thinking about ways to take the data from the Medicaid file um, and put it back into the hands of providers for useful purposes. Okay, um, I'm gonna go quickly through some other just themes of, sort of some of the work we're doing and, and potential um, implications for research. Um, mental illness in primary and specialty care. So this is an, you know, an ongoing and ongoing challenge of how to better integrate um, attention to mental health and substance use into primary care. Um, 
At the department, one of our main strategies, not just for mental health, but in general, for um, promoting best practice in primary care is using, uh, is promoting these electronic health records and health information exchange. Uh, we call this the primary care information project. And we've been trying in the mental hygiene division to leverage some of those lessons and approaches for, for this challenge of behavioral health in primary care. Um, how, we, how do we promote screening, treatment, and referral um, using EHRs? How do we promote um, and increase the use of high quality EHRs in specialty settings? Um, what are the parameters around information exchange, including issues of confidentiality and things like that? Um, what is the role, you know, how do we integrate behavioral health issues into emerging technology around personal health records? So this is a whole new um, sort of domain for behavioral health. Behavioral health has lagged behind um, primary care in the adoption of electronic health records, not least of, uh, of all because of the financial incentives from the from um, the feds for adoption of EHRs, target um, uh, target uh, physicians primarily, uh, the Medicare and Medicaid incentives, and most public mental health practitioners are not physicians. And so there have been structural reasons why some of that incentive money hasn't flowed to the behavioral health community, but the state has stepped up with some funding and there'll be increasing attention paid to, um, to bringing electronic systems into behavioral health, and I think it's going to be a big challenge to understand how they're being integrated, what the unique attributes are of behavioral health practice, um, and then how are they really affecting quality. I mean, that's a larger question, not only for, for behavioral health, but um, has special meaning um, in this sector as well. A word about housing. So, um, uh, in some ways, um, you know, in many ways, the mental health system acknowledges and um, explicitly incorporates an attention to social factors in, in the sort of total, you know, uh, approach to, to consumers. Um, and in our city, in our, uh, we, we have the largest implementation of supportive housing in the country. We have many tens of thousands of units. And we have this history of innovation with new populations that we're offering supportive housing to. Um, many people are familiar with the, these various uh, initiatives, the New York, New York initiatives. Um, there's a lot of interest and continued expansion of supportive housing in the state and the city. Um, a number of new initiatives um, coming out of, for example, um, litigation around, um, in this case, adult homes. Some people might be familiar with this, with this case where um, um, the model of, of, uh, of, of a state, it's a state licensed model of assisted living um, for individuals um, uh, unable to live independently. Um, uh, these are the so-called adult homes. They were uh, made prominent. You've seen them in the, the news lately with some of the Hurricane Sandy um, issues. Um, but there was a case brought um, around uh, the fact that the way these uh, um, places were organized, these tend to be large, large settings, many dozens of people, um, were not um, maximally community integrated. Um, that would be required for the United States Initiative. And many of the people who live in adult homes have psychiatric disabilities. And so there's a new push to provide supportive housing and community opportunities to people uh, living there. And that's just one example, there'll be many more, more over the years. So continued progress of deinstitutionalization and moving towards more community supports um, so there's that trend happening, and then another trend around potentially leveraging Medicaid dollars to, to fund supportive housing and to support the care coordination activities that go along with the housing supports um, that form the basis of the supportive housing model. So a lot of changes, sort of continuing expansion and also the bringing in of a medical perspective and a care coordination perspective to housing um, that have big implications for, um, for this sector and a lot of uh, potential um, opportunities for evaluation of these new models. In particular, you know, this issue that um, when, when you sort of bring in a clinical and a medical perspective to what is fundamentally a housing um, initiative, um, do you lose something um, that you might have had when it was more of a social service um, model? And then another big challenge, Medicaid reform. Um, this is another, again, 
and when thinking about research and evaluation opportunities, big changes happening in the state's Medicaid system, um, driven you know by a combination of interest in reducing costs and improving quality um, for individuals with serious mental illnesses and substance disorders. You know we have a very fragmented system right now. That data from that I showed you before from the Medicaid file shows how fragmented and disconnected the system really is. Um, partly because of our reimbursement structure, where um, people with serious mental illness who are on SSI and many services in mental health and substance use are carved out of managed care. They're not subject to any sort of oversight or, or organization by a managed care organization or by government. They're paid fee for service with all the problems of incentives that go along with that. Um, poor accountability, poor cost controls, not good integration of other medical services. Um, so that's a problem. For individuals with mild to moderate conditions, there's not a lot of performance measurement in our managed care system around behavioral health. The, the quality metrics don't include a lot of um, a lot of that um, uh, information about that. There's a limited ability to promote best practice in, in managed care. This is just an example of the uh, QAR measures. These are the measures that the state measure, um, evaluates managed care organizations on, quality of care. This is the list of QAR measures for diabetes, pretty good. You know, ranging from testing and other uh, things to control of diabetes, etc., etc., etc. And these are the ones for depression. Something about antidepressant medication. That's it. Nothing about screening, nothing about outcomes. Um, so we, we need to make sort of much more robust uh, accountability in our healthcare system for behavioral health issues. How much of the substance use do either, by the way? So what's going to happen for individuals with serious conditions, two things, the rollout of the so-called health homes, these models, new models of care coordination, um, no, not specifically targeting the behavioral health populations, but any, any all finding populations, but interestingly, are sweeping up and incorporating what had previously been case management um, services funded by Medicaid for people with mental illness and people with HIV. Now, sort of all coming into this new model of health homes, um, these are being sort of promoted by the feds and implemented here in the state in a quite widespread way. Um, a lot of questions about their implementation. Um, how effective will they be at coordinating care and improving outcomes for people with these with behavioral health conditions, given that they are a fairly generic structure, with not a lot of requirements for specialization. And then on the managed care front, the city has been very active in promoting the um, development of so-called special needs plans. So if we're going to bring um, mental health and substance use services under managed care, we don't want to do so in a way that simply integrates all that payment and accountability into mainstream managed care plans. We want to preserve some level of specialization at the payer and care management level. And we think that by creating special, so-called special needs plans, that integrate physical and behavioral health while continuing a specialization on these high need populations, that that is the right balance um, for the city. Um, and we want these new special needs plans to promote best practices and new care models that are currently not really supported um, out there in the community. We have a lot of niche programs, we have a lot of special contracts, but things like new, new techniques for crisis version from ERs and hospitals, peer services, employment services. In order to get those to scale, we need to think about them in a managed care context. And we think that these special needs plans are ways to do that. And then as I said before, for individuals with more mild to moderate conditions, how do we expand plan accountability? How do we promote best practices in primary care um, through managed care strategies? So this whole environment is changing. And over the next several years, these new models of managed care will be, will be rolling out. Um, many thousands of people will be moving into new forms of care management and open questions about um, how well it's going, how successful these new models are going to be, how access will be um, affected, how quality will be affected, um, and ultimately how outcomes will change. Um, so this is a whole other realm of potential um, research and evaluation as well. And I'm guessing like, you know, huge amounts of uh, reform and change into a couple of a few remarks here, but this is pretty radical. It's 
going on. Yeah, I mean, just similar things going on in the HIV world which, and in, in the realm of care coordination too. So there's like all of these like tailored, um, you know, complicated HIV care coordination programs that exist. Um, and many of these patients are going to now be eligible for health homes under Medicaid. It's a completely different, non-tailored um, approach to care coordination, and thousands of them will be transitioning in. I think we have some similar research questions in the right. HIV around how this is going to we had, work for patients. Absolutely. We had 10,000 slots of, of so-called targeted case management for people with serious mental illnesses in New York City that just got turned into health homes. Um, and we, uh, we do training through CUNY for the people that work in these programs, right? And uh, it's, uh, it's some real open questions about what, what, how this new model, how we're going to continue to have a uh, focus and an influence on care and care coordination for our populations in this larger context. Do you want to say anything about that, Dan? Well, no, I, I, I mirror, you know, those questions and concerns. I mean, and I guess some of the providers I've spoken with seem to believe that, you know, that there's still going to be a need somehow to have some kind of targeted, more specialized models of care for particularly high-risk groups within the broader group. Now, there, how that will be, if how that something like that would be supportive and what that would look like and how people would be identified for that level versus, I mean, who knows, but yeah, no. Adam, yeah. Uh, before you move on, is there any design to uh, evaluate this or is this, you know, just one of these large <laughs> policy shifts that, that is, you know, a healthcare system shift that makes it very difficult to know how if we will look back to say, I think, well, yeah, yeah. to add on to that too, like your earlier comments about no surveillance system for this. In the HIV world, we, we will evaluate it because yeah. we can see what happens to people where, regardless of where they go and get care. But that in this situation, right? I think it, it's a little bit of both. I think um, there is some attention being paid to evaluation, especially for the things that are sort of more roll, rolling out, like health homes, um, around the managed care front. Um, I would say not as much. and and not as much thinking and planning, nor ability, as Dennis pointed you know, out, to actually figure out what the right, the right way to evaluate it is. It's a huge opportunity, and yeah, I would say. Okay, I'm gonna digress just for two minutes on opioids, just because it's something we're spending a lot of time on. It's not mental health, but it's, it's substance use, close enough. Um, I think people are probably familiar with the topic in general, the emerging epidemic of, of, of uh, uh, prescription opioid use, misuse, and health consequences. Um, this is uh, this is mortality from uh, prescription opioids, um, you know, prescription painkillers, uh, oxycodone, hydrocodone, etc. Um, just you know, in the last decade or so, just you know, just an incredible increase in um, in deaths here in the in the solid line um, that parallel the increase in use and sales of these drugs. And this is a sad story, right, of the sort of co-optation of, you know, the of, of sort of well-intentioned um, uh, clinical practice around uh, palliative care and pain management by pharmaceutical companies and others to, um, to really push the use of these drugs in, um, in a, in a non-judicious way. Um, and now we're seeing the, the effects, unfortunately. Um, here in the city, we haven't been affected as some other parts of the country have been by this epidemic, um, but um, most, uh, we, we've seen, you know, this is just to give you a, an idea of the scale of how many prescriptions in our city are, you know, are being dispensed for the two large categories here, and oxycodone is the main one. This is emergency department visits that again parallel this, and that uh, this is mortality. Um, you know, overdose mortality in our city has been going down over the past several years from heroin and cocaine, um, um, but opioids and benzodiazepines, other prescription drug um, that often works in, in concert to produce fatal outcomes, have been going up um, in the wrong direction. And so we're concerned that that we're not at the same level. We still, you know, only have 150 or so deaths, but we're worried that it's going in the wrong direction. And we also know a little bit about the, um, just to say, like, 
it's so much easier for me to present surveillance data about drugs than it is about mental illness, right? Just to digress. This is the geographic distribution of prescriptions. Um, you see Staten Island is you know, where most of the prescriptions, or many of the prescriptions are being given in the concomitant um, rate of mortality. And this is not your typical um, substance use map, right? This is not your typical substance use map. So we're seeing changing in the immunology. And of course, you know, very you know, important questions as we, as we think about prevention and trying to turn down the supply of prescription opioids because most of, these, most of these drugs start with a prescription by a physician. So the actual interventions and strategies are not so hard to contemplate. As we turn down the supply, are we gonna see switching of, from prescription pills to heroin? You know, so these are some of the questions we're asking. So what are the strategies, you know? Information and clinical guidelines for prescribers using the techniques that we have um, at the health department, like um, specific um, uh, protocols that we can outline in our city health information um, recommendations. Um, these are some of the some of the things we um, we, can, we put into there it's about more judicious use of prescription painkillers, um, shorter durations. You know, not when you go and you know, go to for a dental procedure or a minor outpatient procedure instead of 28 days of some drug that most of us get. Maybe you only need three days. Or only, in the vast majority of cases, you might need only three days or less than that. Things like that. Um, and then, you know, I talk about surveillance. You know, every controlled substance prescription in the state is registered in a database that's administered by the state health department. Um, so we can imagine, you know, there's been limited use of that database to, pre to prevent uh, non-judicious use. Um, and we need to improve that database accessibility, lookup functions, etc. Um, and we also will be hopefully getting access to some of that data in the future. That was a legislative change in Albany this past summer. It was a large bill that was passed to um, do some of these things. And part of that bill actually um, gave local health departments access to the controlled substance registry for the first time. It's very exciting. You can imagine a variety of other strategies that we can be using to control the supply of prescription opioids, more guidelines, um, using that prescribing data, as I said, for quality improvement, marketing, insurance strategies, use how do we um, incorporate controls into DHRs. Okay, so in the last five, 10 minutes, very quick, um, I thought I would just say a few things about um, getting back to that, the concept of public health approaches to mental illness. Um, what are some of the things, you know, we don't traditionally do much of this in the health department, sort of take a community approach, prevention approach to things like depression. But there's a lot more, you know, we, we think about screening, grief interventions, and clinical strategies and primary care and specialty care. What are some of the things we might be thinking about doing around upstream determinants of mental illness? And there's a lot of, you know, emerging epidemiologic evidence that in fact these contextual factors have important um, influences. Um, there are models, service learning for adolescents, experience for this is a model for older adults about engagement, social connectedness as a depression um, intervention. Um, how do we think about the work of the city in terms of neighborhood development, um, uh, economic development, the built environment? Um, these are questions that we don't have great, great strategies right now. I mentioned early psychosis. This is the, to me, this is the prevention approach to serious mental illness. Intervening early in the course of schizophrenia, um, this is a complicated slide, but the, the point of it, basically these are the sort of different um, stages of life, early periods of childhood, puberty and adolescence, where the first um, evidence of, of psychotic illness might manifest itself um, in early adulthood, the sort of initial manifestation and decline and then um, later on. Now, importantly, this is not a progressive decline, right? There are opportunities to arrest the trajectory of schizophrenia and potentially reverse it. There's exciting new research on that topic. It's not a new field. This has been a field that's been rich for, for decades, but I think we have more evidence now about what it takes to create a, pro a program of, of early detection to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, um, to develop these specialized treatment programs, and these are the components of what good clinical care is um, that can potentially, again, interrupt and maybe reverse the, the downward trajectory of, of schizophrenia. And we have no such programs in the city. Um, maybe a few boutique clinical treatment programs around 
um, that don't treat very many people. But we don't have a systematic approach to identifying, referring, and having, resource, having enough capacity to do this sort of thing for everyone who needs it. Um, for the many thousands of people, of young people every year in our city who develop, uh, who develop um, psychosis. So I think this is something that in the managed care conversation we need to be thinking about, how to build these systems through managed care, um, and also how to, how to evaluate um, them, and how to think about identification and dissemination. So I think this is, this is prevention. And then lastly, um, a few words about early childhood. Is this is again the other prevention approach to mental illness. I think is is intervening in early childhood and addressing the you know, promoting hel uh, healthy parenting and reducing um, um, exposure and effects of trauma. That you know um, this is the ACE model, the um, adverse childhood experiences model of uh, the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and and all other things, not just mental health, by the way. So folks are probably familiar with the ACE study. Um, this was a, a big study in California many years ago that followed people um, longitudinally for a decade or so, um, adults, and then asked them about their early childhood experiences and then related it to their adult manifestations of health and disease um, and showed this just incredible sort of monotonic relationship between the number of the so-called adverse childhood experiences and things like smoking and obesity and depression and all these things. And this, this is the number of so-called adverse childhood experiences that people reported. Um, and it's just very dramatic. This is depression, in particular in women. Um, and these are the prevalence rates of depression as a function of how many of these adverse experiences they had. Really dramatic. And these are the types, these are the, these are the different things that we're asked about. And they all have this, these are odds ratios. They all have this, uh, positive relationship. These are just, the, um, the CDC actually incorporated the ACE um, measures into the BRFSS for five states um, back in 2009. And these are the prevalence rates. So this is now more population level, not that Kaiser ACE study. Um, so here's, you know, these are the prevalence rates of adverse childhood experiences in the adult population at a population level, right? 26%, 15%, 12%, right? This is incredible how prevalent these are. And these are the numbers, right? So 40% reported zero, so 60% reported at least one. And there's the. So highly prevalent and highly associated. So back to the population attributable fraction conversation, we have a highly prevalent exposure with a pretty decent association with outcomes. So using the National Comorbidity Study data, um, this is a paper from 2010, and they estimated the popu population attributable fraction for different mental illnesses, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use, et cetera, of these adverse childhood experiences. And they came up with, well, let's look at uh, overall, you know, population attributable fractions of you know, 20 to 30 percent. We can say that. You know, this is sort of an exercise, it's not a perfect science, but if we say that 20 to 30 percent of adult mental illness is attributable to adverse experiences in childhood, that's, that's a great opportunity for, for, for prevention. Can you clarify why uh, early childhood is, is missing here? Is it, is it a, a developed measure, or is it zero to three? Uh, you mean in this particular study? Yeah. I think they just didn't ask it in the study. Recall. Recall, recall right. Just so like, again, is there, is there some thought of adding those kinds of ACE questions to the hands or to any other city surveillance? We thought about it for CHS actually. Right. It's a lot of questions. That's the challenge. But yeah, I mean, they did it at BRFSS, so we could think about it as well. Just to say, this is um, surveillance for early child development um, in Canada. There's ways of looking at, for example, kindergarten students um, and assessing their level of, of development and. and this is this data that the health department in, in Vancouver presents at a neighborhood level of these different, um, you know, measures of vulnerability, developmental vulnerability, percent of children vulnerable, one or more scales. And this is so-called early development index. So this is, you know, this is surveillance for early child development at the population level. Something that we might think about doing here in the city, but we don't do 
I mean, another question is whether or not that those ACE measures could be incorporated into the um, YRVSS. That's another place where you know you're, you could act. It's actually not too late to intervene, right? Two youth groups. It's those high school students, or not at the individual, but using the data from the yeah. students. Yeah, yeah, right. The target research. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. This is this uh, you know sociology from the 19th century, it's reminding us that the contextual factors and group factors, in addition to individual factors, are at the root of, of not only physical health but mental health as well. So. All right, all right. That was a uh, quick run through uh, some of the stuff, but uh, I was trying to, uh, you know, offer some thoughts about population mental health and public health approaches, some of the stuff we're doing around people with serious mental illness, system change, um, and, you know, but happy to have a conversation with them. So, uh, I wanted to raise uh, a focus on the interrelationship between physical and mental health and mental well-being. Um, because I think even the uh, surveillance data ends up underestimating the influence of mental health on adverse health outcomes. Because Medical examiners don't necessarily. Medical, medical examiners aren't going to record the mental illness yeah. unless it's obviously related to the course of death. Yeah. Immediately related yeah. to the course of death, and um, increasingly we're learning how um, the mild and moderate population, which has not yet gotten a lot of attention. Um, of those who are impacted by you know, mental health challenges and PSM diagnoses, but not serious mental illness, um, how their um, health is significantly impacted. We know that the seriously mentally ill have been reported to have a 20 to 25 year shorter right. lifespan. Right. Some of that may be related to the medications that are on, some of it is to sort of unhealthy lifestyles. But the healthier individual with a mild to moderate mental health condition shows up in the community health survey in New York to have, by those, as indicated by high Kessler six scores, mm -hmm. large uh, stress responses, not specific psychological stress. Well, <coughs> that's very closely associated with a lot of unhealthy lifestyle choices, yeah. you know, tobacco and alcohol and uh, lots, of th lots of things. Um, so undoubtedly, and while it doesn't explain causality, there's a very strong association between uh, between health and mental health. There's positive health and mental health as well as sort of like very poor health. And, and I would think that 21st century public health focus on chronic disease, now that we're you know, very much sort of less focused on uh, communicable, mm -hmm at least in uh, uh, economically advanced countries that we are in chronic disease now, really to make a significant impact on managing chronic disease, we're going to have to sort of begin to sort of take into account the influences of underlying stressors and mental health uh, impacts that are affecting people's ability to manage these conditions in right. a more positive way. I mean, you're absolutely right. And not the community health survey data not only shows associations with behaviors, but also with, um, and the literature shows this as well, with sort of disease management, um, ability to adhere to medications and things like that. And so it, it, it continues, it sort of emphasizes the importance of this sort of integration at the practice level. I mean, the community level is one thing, but at least in clinical practice. Um, and I think that some of these new strategies, like use of electronic health records and things like that. But more challenging is you know, how do we incorporate best practices into primary care, like the collaborative care model. The collaborative care model in which specialty care and primary care are working together to manage mental illness um, is, uh, is an evidence best <coughs> practice, hard to implement, hard to implement at scale. We've had around the city various you know, clinics and hospitals that do it, but 
Our challenge, I think, is how to disseminate it more widely. Um, and it's issues of payment, you know, reimbursement, and uh, th that's why we're, we're investing so much of our time on the managed care front, because we think that those types of incentives and, and promoting best practices that come through managed care will, will sort of move the field forward. But, um, but it's not enough. Well, following on some of that, so you, you talked about part of your research agenda being about you know, pulling together some of the existing administrative data sets that you have, such as Medicaid claims, which includes not necessarily diagnoses, but people who are, maybe it does, yeah, but, it does. But, um, but for treatment information. And linking that, you know, starting to link that with, with uh, vital records, for example, can begin to do some of the things that um, Describing the co-occurrence of serious mental illness with certain chronic conditions. Yeah, I and mean, that's that, that's how some of those studies that demonstrated that mortality disparity were done by taking registries of individuals in psychiatric hospitals, for example, and matching them to vital records data. Um, you know, an analogy here in the city could be using Medicaid data. Uh, right, and could you also do the opposite with, with birth records matching to Medicaid, you know, birth records from 20, 30 years ago matching to Medicaid claims data today? I mean, there's imperfections about it, but... Right. I mean, that's the thing we, we uh, talked about this. Like, we don't have, you know, we don't have longitudinal data on very much yeah. <laughs> of anything. You know, in the world of HIV, there actually is longitudinal data on the world of living with HIV and needs and outcomes and things like that. We don't have the same thing. by setting up cohorts, or potentially using administrative data to do it in that way. There are two things that um, I would just like to ask you about. A couple of slides ago where you told me about the childhood, uh, the Vancouver, Vancouver slide, yeah. and there was quite a difference in the color, and do you know those communities? Why were some communities uh, so much darker in terms of the level of childhood? Uh, in terms of the sort of uh, impairments in child development? Yeah. I mean, it's the risk factors that we're, we know. Yeah, we know about. So we can know. take that and we can use it here. That's the idea. And the other thing I was thinking about is that um, very often we don't know how much prevalence there is in terms of depression until we have an event like the World Trade Center or Sandy or something. And then people often come forward with mental health issues, which we never would have seen before if it hadn't been for a particular circumstance. Um, how, how does one build on that and also make it into a public health campaign where it's okay to ask for help? But I think there's still a stigma around people thinking that it's my fault, that I'm you know, feeling so down or whatever. Uh, I mean, one approach is, you know, one approach I mean, there's, there's community approaches and population approaches around stigma. Not, you know, those are often short-lived and not particularly effective. Um, but, um, you know, one sort of, you know, screening is certainly one strategy, right? When you, when you sort of universally screen and you ask primary care physicians, not in the specialty sector, but in the primary care sector where you know, people are coming for routine care, and you um, try to universalize screening in some way of, of at least um, addressing that. Which could be either the health home. Is that the same as medical home that you're talking about? Well, the medical home is the, is the term for the clinical service environment. Health home is the term for the care coordination activities that revolve around it. <coughs> so it's a component of the medical home. It's specifically around this, the navigation and the coordinating and the connecting and the information exchange as opposed to the clinical practice itself. So if doctors were asking not only how are you, you know, what's your diet like and are you exercising, but also some the specific questions about yeah. it. Now, I, I don't think we have great community strategies, frankly, for reducing stigma, for promoting engagement. Um, I would say that's another sort of one of our gaps, frankly. And um, if you look at the relationships between low health literacy and mortality, you know, we have 30 years of great data that say they're highly associated. And yet, 
Australia is the only country that's done a national assessment of the citizenry mental health literacy. We have no uh, really ongoing studies here in the United States about the relationship between health literacy and mental health, nor do we have any promotional campaigns to even elevate the general populace's understanding of mental health issues. And I have no hope for the health exchange that would be set up to move all these millions of people into managed care because uh, as we've been assessing them across the country, we're still in very rudimentary stages, um, they're going to be very underpaid people where, you know, sort of helping you navigate the choices of your plans and the use of your plans. And I haven't seen mental health benefits uh, even on the radar screen. So, you know, your Medicaid data were interesting and pretty compelling. Um, first, just a comment that in the one slide that you showed of those with high clinical need, I, it seemed to, to look as if only 5% were refusing services. So it really was this picture of fragmented, yeah. horribly yeah. fragmented care. Isn't that, I, I don't know how difficult it is to surveil that data source on a routine basis, but isn't that one at least um, surveillance source for monitoring and evaluating the, the shift to managed care because I, your, your main outcomes of interest there are less fragmented care, That's right? right. And uh, absolutely, I think you're right. And to, so to what extent are the populations appropriately aligned for Medicaid and some of the, the big sh shifts in, in, in packaged care? Uh, they're pretty well aligned. I mean, in our city, having a serious mental illness um, is pretty highly correlated with being poor and being um, and way up and with a very debilitating mental illness with being on SSI, which is an automatic Medicaid eligibility. So the vast majority of people, not all, the majority of people with the most serious and debilitating mental illnesses are on Medicaid. Um, and so that is a good way of monitoring the stat, this sort of state of the population with serious mental illness. Are there any potential comparison groups here that, as these, you know, shifts in care and the structure of care roll out? With sort of a, sort of a better managed or more accountable model of care? An actual experiment. Well, you could, I mean, I don't, I don't really know, I mean, it, it's hard to, now that I'm in academia, not at, uh, it's a little hard to monitor the development of the health homes um, regionally, but, but there is actually, I mean, it isn't like it's all being turned on at once. So I, I, I suppose it might be possible to, um, to come up with some kind of a way to look, to try to see whether development of, of, of any version of these uh, um, of these health home arrangements for that population could influence some of those um, factors that you're monitoring. I think what you're saying is it's less about finding a comparison population I think it's than right. finding differential information. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a vast network of providers, community-based providers, hospital-based providers, individual practitioners, yeah. interacting states. in all kinds of different ways. State. States will do it differently. In well, state. even in, yeah. even in, in this state, they're doing it differently yeah. in different boroughs. Yeah. They're doing, di it's not like it's all going to be So there's, there's timing, different parts there's, of there are, you're right, other states. There's, within our state, for example, the special needs plan model, the integrated physical and behavioral health managed care model that we're going to do in the city will probably not be the same model that are, that's done outside the city. Right. So there's opportunities to compare there and so yeah, there's a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to track the data when there's so many different kinds of mental health providers and social workers that are like Right. So this is, it gets very complex to, um, to tease apart what the relative contributions of these different things are, but that's, that's where you guys can <laughs> tell us how to do it. I know you've been looking at um, community resilience in terms of um, you know, trauma effects and disasters, but looking at your map, was there any interest, do you think there's any interest in looking at community resilience and community resilience building as a preventive strategy? 
Right. So, I mean, we, we think about that a lot, and I think it gets to these uh, questions of what are the contextual determinants of mental health, yeah. and this, you know, and what the specific strategies for building community resilience would be, and um, how do they differ from um, the kind of uh, approaches we might want to take more generally to to enhance communities' um, sort of ability to manage and prevent. I would think that they correlate pretty closely to the community resilience strategies that are employed for trauma and disaster, so that it might have some, so that as long as one was looking at those kinds of strategies, yes. this might be one that's not the question. And, you know, we're going to be rolling out in the near future a pretty large response to the hurricane that will involve um, a lot of on-the-ground crisis counselors, There'll be a media campaign. Be, it'll be, it's based on the Project Liberty model that we did after 9-11. And so um, a big part of that campaign is going to involve interacting with community leaders, community groups, um, faith-based organizations, etc., to bring these messages of, of, of um, coping and of um, sort of managing through a crisis. Right, but one of the issues with that is that when you do that under depending on how you fund that you can't do proper you can't really do a proper study because you're supposed to be providing oh service. yeah right we can't do that. and <laughs> and what i'm asking about is the possibility of thinking about finding ways to start studying community resilience more systematically to see if it works and it's yeah. right. one thing we've always been thinking around is, is issues of trauma and resilience that there are, we, right, we don't have to wait for things like Sandy or, you know, to, to do the, some of those studies. There's, I mean, like the East data tell us, there's a baseline level of exposure going on in our communities that's exactly. very high. I think you also mentioned the importance of building um, parenting skills and parent capacity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, just wondered if you could say something about how how one scales things up. So like if we know, for example, nurse family partnership and that kind of early support for pair for young parents is really effective, but it's still it's often, you know, reaching small groups of people. And that's it's a challenge. Like, when, you know, when, when you're stre that's why I sort of flew by that slide, but you know, what are the those are you know when you when you rely on individual level strategies like one on one yeah. parent support, like nurse family partnership, you you're in the world of resources and scalability. That program is very, is an effective program. It costs maybe $6,000 per family per year. It's quite expensive. Some of these early childhood programs, um, uh, these, these evidence-based child early child development programs, Abbasidarian, Perry Preschool, these things are in the realm of ten to 11000 but the ultimate, I mean, but is that where the politics comes into it? Because it's, I mean, because they ultimately it. save money. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, how do you convince people? They're not under politicians' watch. Well, yeah, I mean, this yeah. is one of the things I, I wanted to go yeah. back to the HIV yeah. lessons that could yeah. be potentially reported here. And um, there's been a lot of effort looking you know, at cost effectiveness of different interventions. So not just looking at, not comparing the cost of money that you spend to what you save, but actually linking it to outcomes and societal benefits related to you know, subsequent morbidity, public dollars used, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes a while. First, you have to find out what's effective. It sounds like you may have a few things yeah. like that where you can begin to examine. And then you can decide how best to target things. But the, the, the one thing that I would really I would really be interested in knowing more about, and if you could do something like this, is the one thing that has mobilized the field of HIV in the last five years in this country has been this national HIV AIDS strategy that Obama has put together. And around that came um, actually from Sub-Saharan Africa, this idea of putting together you know, the so-called HIV cascade. And we've talked about this a little bit, where you know, it's basically a bar graph that starts at the top with everyone living with HIV. You know, in the US, we have a bar of 1.1 million people. And then of those, and for you, it could be severe mental illness. Um, you know, the next bar is what proportion of them are diagnosed. 
The next bar is what proportion of them you know, are rec have received care in the last year. And the next bar is like what proportion of them are continuously retaining that care. Could be, and then another one on medications, and then another one successfully treated, because not everyone on medication is successfully treated. Putting that cascade together has mobilized the, the field of HIV research, practice, into this notion of how do we best go about implementing using the, the evidence-based strategies we have, and how do we focus our research dollars on finding out which strategies will impact which aspect of the cascade. I think there are so many parallels, and, and I know you've said this too, between the HIV world and the mental health world, and, and there's a place for a cascade in mental health. And I think there, it, it's, it's in the Department of Mental Hygiene where you're, you're taking a public health focus and long view on this. I think we have the component parts of that, but you're right, sort of putting it together in that way would be very useful. And that's where you start, and you can, so you can break it out. You can look at Brooklyn's cascade, you can look at cascade for males and females, but the main thing is to start with the citywide cascade. Decide who's in, you know, what, what is it? Is it severe mental illness? Is it, you know, depression? I mean, you, know, you decide what the denominator is, but then you construct it citywide. So where does the promotion come in? What's the, the where does the cascade keep going and end up? In, in the HIV world, we stop it with viral suppression, which is what most benefits the individual and also what most benefits society and prevents spread. And you don't have the spread issue, but you do have things that people with severe mental illness do that affect society. But well, that's that is one one big difference, right? I mean, yeah. this is a disease management model, right? It's right. suggest, which is mental has oh. has value which has strong value in and of itself. It's not just disease, it's prevention. It's prevention. Um, because, I mean, they're one and the same in the HIV. Yeah, no, we're not talking about But it starts with diagnosis, diagnosis. I think is the yeah. point. Yeah. Yes, yeah. early diagnosis. But there's, you know, that's... But it could, go, well, they, I think, it could I, keep going. I think the analog to the viral suppression for mental health, mental illness, would be functionality. So that, you know, because Depression and anxiety, the, 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 the analysis of the NCSR demonstrated that 60% of folks who have significant anxiety and depression have lots of impairments, very significant functional impairments. Uh, so we're not talking about a condition that is very trivial, despite the very large numbers of the population that in one course of the year, 25 to 30% have the DSM diagnosis. Uh, and there are significant functional impairments, either personally, in the workplace, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the cascade could lead to, you could have depression, but still be able to have like a higher level of functioning. And, and the fact is that we have no, almost no way of tracking that on the ultimate outcome that we're interested in. Either functional status, you can imagine score, scale scores, like the PHQ-9 score can be used as a measure of treatment efficacy, anything like that. Um, we, have, we have no such measures in, the, in, in our, in our in, our, in all those data sources that I talked about. There's no an analog of sort of viral load. Mm -hmm. um, there's an analog conceptually, but our ability to track it on our Now, you know, this is a question for us as we think about, you know, new managed care design. How do you hold a managed care company accountable for recovery for functional status? But, you know, we can, we can imagine a, a situation, uh, a system in which that's an obligation of, of providers to assess functional status on an annual basis. It's an, it's an amazing system that doesn't have any of those outcomes as a matter of routine at monitoring. If you were to generate a cascade, you'd be doing it largely from a combination of administrative data and survey data. Right. Rather than exactly. Rather administrative than referring to Medicaid. Oh. Right. We have the same issue. I mean, we, we don't know how many people are really living with HIV. We have right. to estimate it from mm -hmm. different methods. Um, and then, and the administrative data tell us how many people are in care. But for serious mental illness, the Medicaid data, as we said before, is pretty good. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's good in terms of capturing population, how good it is to measure the kind of things we're talking about. It's very how, complex. How do you link that to your promotion and prevention efforts for people who, before diagnosis, you know, before the 
Well, getting undiagnosed HIV is a big part of, of finding people who, who have HIV who are undiagnosed is a big part. As it would in terms of preventing HIV transmission, how do you think the cascade to that? Um, well, the, that bottom line of, of lowering people's viral load in care is the, is the way. Is it self-prevention? Self-prevention strategy. Just like they transmit. Yeah, okay. I mean, we, so we're very much in the realm where, where treatment and prevention are sort of one okay. in, the, in the world of HIV. It's different yeah. for you guys. This is dealing with, you know, who, who's sick, who, who has mental illness today, and who's going to be uh, have yeah. acquiring it. Um, mm -hmm. Although there's some analogs, like for yeah. example, the treatment of maternal depression is prevention right, for and promotion of healthy childhood. Mm -hmm. right, so yeah, that's an important there, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there are connections between the treatment. Mm -hmm. There is sort of analogs. But I mean, and I also for our systems, because uh, I learned that children by the eight, by the third grade who are absent from school by 30 days, 30 more days missing school in the course of a year, they're much, much, they're highly likely to be high school dropouts. So these, these, these are eight-year-olds. Who are not just hanging, you know, who are not hanging out on street corners with their peer group, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something to be investigated very early on that shows up in our public schools uh, that is likely to be highly associated with you know, poor mental health outcomes and ability to hold down jobs, to uh, get a high school diploma, possibly go to college, etc. Et so that that kind of cross system. Surveillance is, yeah. is, you know, that's something Lauren is also is really pioneering in the health department. You know, matching, for example, some of our health department surveillance data with the Department of Homeless Services data. You know, this, you know, child welfare, homeless, correctional, sort of the list goes on of overlaps between, you know, the public <coughs> health system and these other, other services, education. So, thank you, Adam. Okay. I think you've given us uh, a lot of things.